This is Pastor M.D. Lewis, the speaker for the Bible Interpreter Tapes, and we are discussing the subject, Saul, the object of God's wrath. I call your attention to 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter, verse 15, which reads, But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. Now, this text, you see, uh, calls our attention uh, to the basic principle that I have referred to in the previous studies quite repeatedly. To Exodus 20, verse 5, I will visit the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate. <clears throat> now, the issue that uh, we are involved with in the life of Saul is the matter of who shall be king over Israel. Now, you will recall that uh, Israel, because of certain battles that took place and certain violence that came upon them, uh, were anxious to have a king uh, to reign over them. And in 1 Samuel 8, verse 7, the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, that is, they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me, that I should reign over them. Now, I imagine that was a tremendous disappointment to God, uh, that uh, they would uh, uh, turn from him to select a human being to reign over them. Now, certainly God knew the nature of the heart of men, that it would be nothing compared to what God would do in his compassion to be willing to die in their place for them. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in verse 9 of that same chapter 8 for Samuel, Now therefore hearken unto their voice. This is God speaking to Samuel. Howbeit yet protest sol solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Well, even though Samuel did that, uh, as it says in verse 19, Nay, but we will have a king reign over us. And uh, so the Lord said to Samuel, verse 22, Hearken unto their voice and make them a king. Now, you see, this uh, aspect and this experience in the lives of the children of Israel has more to do than just appears on the surface uh, in, uh, in insisting upon a man ruling over them as king they are turning against God, and so it's obvious they do not comprehend the extent to which God is directing their life. Out of the great issue of his dying for their sins and not afflicting them according to the degree of their wickedness, as the text I read in, uh, uh, in Ezra 9.13, he has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. In other words, God's attitude towards Israel was to take the punishment of their transgression uh, and uh, uh, save Israel from it, but in the event that you must let them suffer to realize the, the ill conduct of their life, only let them have a portion of what actually ought to come to them. Well, with such compassion, with what, such mercy and such long-suffering, they would never get that treatment from a man, and God is going to permit them <clears throat> to have the king of their choice uh, to show this particular issue to them. So now let's look at verse, uh, 1 Samuel 12, verse 15. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Now in the scripture uh, it says that uh, if they will be, uh, if they will turn to the Lord, the Lord will be their savior. But if they turn against the Lord, then the Lord will be their enemy. Now, a person must understand this, as it's illustrated here in the life of Saul. If they turn away from God, then God will permit the, the wrath of their enemies to come upon them. And inasmuch as God has suffered the wrath of those enemies, and their wrath is coming upon the people of Israel, then it could be said that God is their enemy. Because the... the, the wrath of the enemy, God has suffered, and when the enemy inflict it, they are inflicting upon Israel the wrath that Christ has already suffered on Calvary. Now, a, a person needs to see this, or these stories in the Bible do not have the depth that a person uh, would ordinarily observe. 
Now, notice in verse 23 of the same chapter, Second, First Samuel uh, 12, uh, or perhaps I um, should say First chapter 15, verse 23. I'm reading this from the book of Samuel. <coughs> Excuse me. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as is obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. In other words, in obedience to God, the sacrifice would only have meaning, uh, which represents Christ. So when we obey, then the sacrifice of Christ's suffering is applicable to us. But if we do not obey, then the sacrifice of Christ is a wrath to us, coming from our enemies. <clears throat> Verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from becoming, from being king. So when they turn against God, that conduct will also, uh, should I say, actuate God to return the same unto them. That as they sow, they reap. What attitude they exhibit towards God is the uh, attitude that he would, uh, of necessity, have to exhibit towards them in the course of time but only after his mercy is exhausted. So the choosing of, of a king uh, in, in the case of Israel, in choosing Saul in preference to God, uh, is implying the issue of the subject of the wrath of God in a very, very special manner. And uh, <clears throat> this is what uh, uh, I, I want the, you to see in this study, that whenever a person turns against God as their king, who has suffered the wrath of their transgressions, they are making a very serious mistake. So this uh, subject is, uh, uh, is illustrated in the, uh, the story of Samuel. Now let's go back and take a look at uh, some of the factors in the aspect of Samuel in the 10th chapter. Uh, you recall the story how that uh, Samuel, or that uh, Saul, with one of his servants, were out looking for the lost donkeys, uh, of his father, and uh, they didn't find them, but uh, they came in contact with Samuel, and uh, inasmuch as this is the person that the people wanted to become king, you remember Samuel, Samuel anointed him. Now, notice what God did for Saul. This is very, very important. <clears throat> this is First Samuel 10, verse 6. In the course of conversation of Samuel with Saul, uh, he said, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. This is verse 6, Samuel First uh, Samuel 10, verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. You'll be turned into another man. The Spirit of God will turn him into another man. That is, uh, he will be converted. Now, verse 9 of the same chapter brings this out. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. <clears throat> now, the reason why I quote these verses is to show that even though the people rejected God as their king, the king who died on Calvary to suffer the ill consequence of their life, and also the life of their enemies, that he might protect them, uh, them from their own iniquity and their own transgressions and their own wrath that would ordinarily come upon them, they turned that king down to select one from men. <clears throat> now, even though they rebelled against God in this particular affair, to show the character of God in his compassion and love towards the human race and his people, he did everything possible to prepare Saul to be a king who would uh, carry on the responsibilities reflecting the nature of God, that is, their protector, that is, one who would prevent them from receiving wrath from their enemies, uh, one who would be compassionate towards them uh, and preserve their life, and so forth. Now, you see, God is doing everything. Even though he did not uh, uh, condone this particular activity, it says there that he uh, would grant them uh, this, even though it was against uh, his uh, intent, as it says in First Samuel 8, 9, Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest, 
solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So even though God did not uh, condone the fact that they would turn against him and choose a man for king, uh, he said, protest, 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 and show them what will be the consequence. And if they insist, then go along with them and choose him as king. But even under those circumstances, God is compassionate and does everything to prepare Saul to be a blessing to his people and to reflect God and his protecting care over the saints. So he gives him the Holy Spirit, changes him to another man, and uh, prepares him to be a champion for God. And he was, as you recall, uh, there were instances uh, of the fighting of the, against the, the Philistines that uh, he was uh, very victorious, and then there, come, there came the instance of where the, the Ammonites came up against him and with King Nahash, uh, who uh, evaded one of the eastern cities of Palestine and, and told the people that he would put out their eye uh, as a uh, uh, as a infliction upon them. Uh, when Saul heard it, it says, and the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard these tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly that these people would, uh, would even dare to do such a, a violent and hurtful thing by putting their eye, one eye out. And uh, Saul rallied, and as you recall, they had a great victory over those people. So God uh, worked with Saul and enabled him uh, in many instances to protect uh, uh, the saints from receiving the infliction of wrath from their enemies. But as you know, the course of time went on when uh, Saul became uh, rebellious against God, and the Lord had to... uh, to reject him. And you remember the prophet came, Samuel came uh, to, to Saul, and he said, as recorded in 1 Samuel 15, I'm reading now uh, verse 10 and 11. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that uh, I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried unto the Lord all night. Now here you have a picture of the prophet revealing the character of God, that when Saul refused to be obedient and to exhibit the real character of a king, a protector of God's people uh, from uh, from wrath and the violence of sin and so forth, when he became a, a, a transgressor and did not obey God, It grieved Samuel, and he wept all night and cried unto God all night in behalf of Saul. But uh, Saul did not keep the commandments of the Lord, and they had to reject him. And so the text that I read, uh, he was rejected, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee, because he did not obey the voice of God, but listened to the people. Now you see, in Jeremiah, the 22nd chapter Uh, we get the picture of the consequence of this and why Saul becomes the object of God's wrath because of his dealing in disobedience. It was not possible that he could lead the people to the great sacrifice of Christ to protect them from their own transgressions. I'm reading Jeremiah 22, verse 7, and it reads like this, And I will prepare destroyers against thee, every one with his weapon, weapons, and they shall cut down thy choice cedars and cast them into the fire. Now here it says, God says, I will prepare destroyers against thee. Now, not only would he prepare destroyers in the sense of the Philistines and the Assyrians and the Babylonians, <clears throat> in this case, because they have chosen Saul over God as their king, it will be shown that even Saul shall become uh, a destroyer to them. Now, I know that because in this text that I'm reading in first in Jeremiah uh, 22, 7, and I will prepare destroyers. Uh, the word for destroyers in this particular text is a Hebrew word pronounced shaketh. And let me read to you the, the analysis of this word shaketh as found in Isaiah 54, Verse 16, Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and bringeth forth an instrument for his work. 
Now, this is very characteristic of a Hebrew prophet. When he wants to teach something, we'll pick out some particular object of which the people are familiar. Here it is, a blacksmith's forge. I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and bringeth forth an instrument for his work. Now he'll switch into the spiritual aspect and say, And I have created the waster to destroy. Now, as the fire has prepared the piece of metal for the blacksmith to make some instrument out of it, so that fire and hatred uh, in society has uh, created the situation for the instrument, which he says here, I have created the waster to destroy. Now, the word waster here is the same word, shakat, which is found in Jeremiah 22, uh, verse 7, I have prepared destroyers. And that word destroyers is the same word over here for waster to destroy. Now, you recall in the previous lesson, I showed uh, you the text in 1 Corinthians 5, 25, 5, where it says, And God will deliver such persons unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, God is preparing destroyers, and every destroyer that God has prepared, whether it is Saul, or whether it is the Babylonians, or whether it's the Philistines, God has prepared them. He has prepared them because he has suffered the wrath of their sins. And their infliction upon Israel be, will be under his control because he has suffered the wrath that they are going to afflict Israel with. Now do you see what it means, I have prepared destroyers. Now whether they're talking about Saul, or whether they're talking about uh, Assyria, or who uh, the case may be, uh, God has prepared them inasmuch as he has died in their place for them. So uh, we see that uh, the Lord is... Uh, uh, is working for his people, and when you understand the subject of wrath, you get an insight into how he deals with mankind in reference to the subject of wrath, for it holds a great deal of information uh, in the revelation of God's dealing with the human race. Now, I'm turning to the book of Ezra, the 8th chapter and verse 22. For I was ashamed, this is Ezra speaking to the king, uh, when he was going to take the, the gold and some assistance back uh, to the people in Jerusalem. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. <clears throat> now, here again, you see, this text would indicate that God in his wrath is against all those who forsake him. Well, God is not <clears throat> exhibiting his wrath <clears throat> against those who forsake him. But he is permitting the wrath that he has suffered in the lives of others to come upon those who forsake him. So the enemies that God is preparing uh, is those whom, of course, he has suffered the ill of their life. The book of Jeremiah, this text I think I mentioned to you previously, but it will be applicable here again, and I want to call your attention to its uh, explicit wording. This is Jeremiah 11, verse 17. For the Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah. God has pronounced evil uh, against thee, for the evil that they have done. Now, you recall that in the book of, uh, of Samuel, in regards to, uh, to Saul, that uh, the very same wording is used. I'm reading now uh, from this text uh, <clears throat> in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, this text is comparable to the text that says, God in his wrath does so-and-so. Here it says that God sent an evil spirit. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Well, now, why would he say that an evil spirit from God troubles him? Uh, this would seem almost contrary to the entire Bible. But inasmuch as God suffered every ill in Saul's life, any ill that comes to Saul in the sense of an evil spirit, Christ has already suffered that on Calvary. Now, I'm getting very, very close uh, to some things that I am not really saying out and out, but perhaps I should just as well say them at this juncture, 
because this will make very clear the statement that God has sent an evil spirit against Saul. And uh, I want to lay down a particular concept in this lesson uh, to, to be of help, and it's spoken of in the Mount of Blessings, page 71. And it says, He who is imbued with the Spirit of Christ abides in Christ. Now Saul did that at first. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior. Now, you remember I said that in the case of David when they were going to, uh, to uh, inflict a blow upon him for the sin of Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. And I told you that uh, the word abar, which means that Christ passed in between uh, David and the one inflicting the blow, and Christ took the blow. This statement is saying the same thing. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior, who surrounds him with his presence. Now, I'm reading, I'm, the reason I'm reading this is to show you that G God surrounded Saul with his presence. And even when it comes down to the aspect of this evil spirit, uh, God has not left him, and Saul does not become the object of his wrath until he gets to the great hatred uh, where he was going to uh, unite himself with Satan by uh, seeking the advice of the witch of Ender. Now, let me go on with this reading of this statement from Mount of Blessings, page 71. The blow that is aimed at him falls upon the Savior who surrounds him with his presence. Whatever comes to him comes, comes from Christ. He has no need to resist evil, for Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission, and all things that are permitted to work together for good to them that love the Lord, quoting Romans 8.28. Now, the, the sentiment of this particular statement is precisely what I have endeavored uh, to get across on the subject of wrath. Whatever comes to the sinner, now in this case of Saul, comes from Christ, because Christ has suffered the consequence of his entire wrath and sin. For Christ is his defense. Nothing can touch him except by our Lord's permission. So if there's any wrath that came to Saul, it first must come through Christ before it ever gets to Saul. Now, that viewpoint is very essential in interpreting uh, wrath in the Old Testament. And it uh, comes from the lessons that I've already shown, that Christ on Calvary suffers the wrath. He uh, controls all the, the avenues of, uh, of punishment upon the individual. And a person must conclude this in his uh, observation of wrath, that nothing comes to the individual that does not first come from uh, from, from, from God. Now, when you come to the, the text that indicates Saul's death, which is found in First Chronicles, the 10th chapter, uh, I want you to see now how you, may, you must be uh, prepared to receive uh, this type of reading. I'm reading now from First Chronicles 10, verse 4. Then, Saul, then said Saul to his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. Now, you remember he had been wounded. But his armor-bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. So Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise on his sword and died. So to, to indicate then he actually died from falling on his sword is, is indicated by the following text. So it's very, very clear how Saul died. He committed suicide by putting the, the sword in his stomach and falling forward, and he probably weighed about 250, and uh, it went uh, through his body and killed him. Now, the Bible says in the 14th verse of the same chapter, and uh, it says that uh, the familiar spirit came, and he inquired of it, and, and inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him. Now, here it says that God slew Saul. Well, God did not slay Saul. The uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 719, says, Satan destroyed Saul. So you see, here we have that uh, God slew him, we have that Satan slew him, we have that the Philistines shot and wounded him, and Saul took his sword and fell upon it, which obviously is the method of which he died. But because of the evil which he did, the Lord brought this evil upon him. Now it says in Jeremiah 11, verse 17, For the Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. So here it says that the evil 
that God pronounced against Israel, or we may say in this case, the evil that God pronounced against Saul was the evil which he did against himself. Now, inasmuch as the evil he did against himself was according to the law of sin and death, the law of wrath, it says in the Bible that God killed him. That is, the process of the law of sin and death and wrath uh, was the law of God. In that sense, God killed him. But inasmuch as Satan inspired Saul in the way of evil to, uh, to lead him to resort to consulting the witch of Ender, which was the manifestation of evil spirits, it's very, very obvious that Satan had a very definite hand in destroying Saul. So you see in the, the uh, subject of Saul, the wrath of God uh, was not that God uh, became angry because the prophet uh, uh, Samuel exhibited the character of God uh, in that he, he uh, grieved all night long for Saul, uh, that uh, God uh, was endeavoring to show his, his kindness towards Saul, uh, endeavoring to save him, but he would not resort to the influence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in contrast, he in, uh, turned to Satan and the witch of Ender, and Satan had final absolute control, and the wrath that came upon Saul came from Satan and his own evil life. So the subject of wrath is very important when we understand that God suffered the wrath of all sinners, and if they turn away from him, then they must suffer the wrath of their own consequence or that which Satan will bring upon them.